so for those of you all who don't know me, um, my name is Danny Cook and I am with ruralvote.org. Rural Vote is the um, IE side, um, it's the PAC side of ruralorganizing.org. And um, and so I came to Rural Org first, ruralorg.org um, in January after having worked on the Stacey Abrams campaign last year. Most people that know me, know me because of a healthcare protest that I was heavily involved in here in Bristol, Tennessee, Bristol, Virginia, the Tri-Cities area, um, because I led a protest where we like literally lived outside of a hospital for 257 days straight, 24 or seven, and um, took like 30,000 local signatures to Congress and that sort of stuff. And so I'm usually an issue girl, but issues led me into more politics and here we are. So I'm happy to be here um, and really looking forward to how we can use data to make progress happen in rural spaces because that's where I was born and raised and that's where I'm in now, right? So I am going to share my screen with you and maybe if it lets me, but it will. Give me one sec. <clears throat> there we go. All right. Okay, so this project was something that I started working on in the spring. And um, the idea behind it is not just about, you know, looking for rural counties um, that we could be impactful in. It was looking for rural counties where we could actually build power as we go into 2024. Um, so the things that you should remember is that this is a focus on power building. Um, so there are going to be counties that made the list and counties that didn't. But those counties that didn't, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be focused on because they should. We're just looking for where we can make power moves. So this is a short-term strategy um, that's part of a longer-term strategy, short-term piece, right? 17 states ended up on this list. Colorado is one of those. Um, so what I did to get here is I went through the elections from 2020, 2022, every single one of them that you see listed here, looked up voter registration data, turnout results, state population and percent rule to get this together. So what does that look like? So I started by looking at states that had margins that were 10% or less or swing states, um, battleground states, that sort of thing. Within those states for each of those elections, I literally wrote out all of the counties that had margins that were 10% or less. And then I cross-referenced those counties across those elections to see which ones kept coming up. So then I identified the top or the most repetitive counties that were showing up in most of the elections, right? So if they were close in one election, but then they weren't close again for any of the others, then didn't make it, right? But if they kept consistently showing up, then we identified those counties. And then I looked at the population of those counties, the percent rule, and then got to the point where, where what were the common districts or seats in these states, so in these counties? So a lot of times people will say, well, what's the state that we want to flip? Well, we didn't want to approach it from that way. We wanted to let the data drive us to the places where we can flip them the fastest, where we can gain seats the quickest and, and build the most power um, in a short term, right? So <clears throat> what does that look like for Colorado? So while you guys were solidly Democratic in the presidential election, right, in your 2022 Senate races, um, Alamosa, um, Archuleta, Conejos, Garfield, and I hope I say this right, Rofano and Los Animos and Rio Grande were selected because they are all part of House District 3. Y'all know who that is. That's Bobart, right? Um, and so her win was less than a percent. It was 0.16% margin with just 546 votes. Um, five of the seven counties had margins in that house rate of votes that were 200 votes or less. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I said? Five counties, five of the seven in her district, the, the voting difference were 200 votes or less. And there were almost 28,000 registered voters that didn't vote. So we could very quickly and efficiently gain some power there, right? So let me see. I see the chat popping already. Right, Annie. <laughs> <coughs> So like, this is why I said, I was so excited because here's the thing, I don't live in all of these states. So I don't know where your counties are. I don't know what districts they're in. So when I'm looking, I'm literally only looking at the data, right? So when I got to the end of this sucker and I was like, oh my gosh, look, they were just short. They were so small margins and look, they're all in this district. And 
all of my inner nerd was like choo, 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 on display. But so this is the clean version that you guys are going to get this PDF presentation you're going to get. I'm not going to go through this presentation and read it all to you. Why? Because you're going to get it and you're going to review it yourself. What I am going to show you is what I call my dirty data. <laughs> so it's the process that I went through to get to this um, because I think it's helpful for you to see the raw data um, so that you know what's behind these final numbers that you can put to use. So I'm going to stop sharing real quick and I'm going to go to the dirty data. All right. So when you look at Colorado, so these are your counties, okay? And um, these are your percentages of rural. So all of the counties on this list were at least 24% or better rural, um, most of them falling in that 50, 40, 60 range. So that's about kind of the average of rural. So what that means is there's 53,166 rural people in just these seven counties. <clears throat> and so we start to look at what those votes are. And I'm going to go into that part a little bit more later. But over here in this county, if you look at the presidential race, yeah, we can add just the 23,959 registered voters that didn't vote in the presidential election could add another 5% spread, right? Even though we won that, right? It doesn't hurt to keep adding to. We don't want to lose ground. We want to keep building on what we already have. But in the House district, this is where it gets crazy because there was only 546 votes and there were 27,858 people not voting. And that would have been 5,100% of the voting difference, <laughs> 5,000 times what we need, right? So what does that look like when you break it down? I'm going to go here. So this is my dirty data, which is why you see all the color coding, right? So the way I started this process was writing down all of the, all of the counties in Colorado that had margins 10% or less, then identifying the ones that had 5% or less, right? Those are the ones that you see identified here and doing that all the way across. And then looking at your percentage rule, population, state population rank, and then saying, how many counties in the presidential race did you all have that were 5% or less margins? Four. How many um, that were 10% or less? Three. So you had seven counties, right? Total. For the Senate, you had nine. Um, so keep in mind, this is everybody. So I'll just say this, when I first did this, if you're not part of our monthly networking calls, I did an overview and um, and I shared Colorado as, as part of it just briefly. And somebody said, well, why isn't Hensdale on that list? Because it didn't make the final cut. And I said, I'm so glad you asked. It didn't make the list because look at the population of Hensdale, right? If there's 900 people that live in Hensdale, right? We, it's not a place where you're going to build power. Is it essential? 100%. Should you organize there? Absolutely, right? But it's not going to be a place where we're going to say, go to a funder and use this data to get more money. It should be roped into your other initiatives with bordering counties, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so when I go down here and I look at your presidential elections, there are three columns, your Dem votes, your Republican votes, and then your other votes, Okay. I want to focus on this column for just a second. Um, wait, I'm lying. Before I go there, I want to go back up here to your voting data. <laughs> so this is your voter registration numbers. And this is the percent of people in those counties that are registered to vote. Okay. Would it be helpful if I enlarged it a little bit? Is that better, guys? Okay, cool. So if you look, you have awesome voter registration. Now, I don't know if that's because you're automatically registered to vote when you get a driver's license or an ID at the DMV, or if it's something that people actually have to voluntarily like opt into. Um, I've seen it both ways. So if this is something that happens automatically, then the high numbers aren't that impressive. But that if this is something that people have to actually opt into, if they have to check that box at the DMV or fill out a voter registration form, these numbers are important and they are significant because the lowest voter registration that you have is 66%, which is insane, right? Most of them are in the 70s and 80%. Archuleta has 94% of the people registered to vote. That's pretty stinking fantastic, right? Um, there are a lot of places that I see that only have 50 to 60% of the people registered to vote. Why is this important? 
it's important because when you start to look at your GOTV strategy, um, whether it's for a campaign, an issue campaign, or a, polit a political campaign, and when you think about where you're going to put your efforts and your money and your manpower, this tells me clearly you do not need heavy emphasis on registering people because they're registered already, right? But we want to see, are they actually turning out to vote? So if I have 67% of the population that's registered to vote, but only 46% is voting in a presidential election, for some reason, these people are not engaged. Um, and so that's important. <clears throat> gotcha, right, migrant workers. See, and those are things that local people will know that I don't know, but it's absolutely 100% important. And I, and I love that you're adding that to the conversation because it is, those are things that I wouldn't know. Right. Um, but when you look at who's not actually turning out to vote that is registered, it's concerning. Only 34%, almost 35% of the people voted in who's going to be your governor and in your Senate race. Is that because they really don't understand how important a gubernatorial election is? Because some people don't, Right. Um, I've had people that say, you know, oh, I vote for the pre I, I vote for the federal election and that's it. Because, you know, the state doesn't really matter. The state's actually pretty daggone important. And so I'll say to people, well, do you know what your governor does? And they'll say, no, I explain it to people the same way I explained it to my nine-year-old grandson. He was eight at the time. Um, when I went to work for the Abrams campaign, I said, babe, listen, Tutu's not going to be able to come and get you as often because I'm going to go work on a campaign for the next governor of Georgia. And he said, what's a governor? And I said, well, you know how the president is in charge of all the states and makes all the decision about the monies for all the states? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, that's what a governor does for its state. And he said, oh, so it's like the president of Georgia. And I said, yep, just like that. <laughs> And so that's how he, that's what he told his friends. My tutu is going to, my tutu is working for the next president of Georgia. Um, but it was a great way for him to understand how important a governor is. Um, but when you only have, you know, 30%, 40% of the population voting, that's an important thing for them to know. Now we're going to go to this column that I was talking about before. So I want you all to rewind as painful as it might be and go back to 2020. And think about how critical this election was. And I want you to look at the voting difference in Alamosa, for example, Alamosa. You're talking about a race that was 60 votes, actually less than 60 votes, right? In terms of a difference, 54. 54 votes was the difference. 235 people voted other. Knowing what was on the line in 2020, 235 people could not bring themselves to vote for either Trump or Biden. And had we gained those 235 votes on the progressive side, we, then Democrats would have flipped this county by 181 votes. <clears throat> and that's the case in a lot of these communities. So when you look here at Grand, Hensdale, God bless it, um, and um, am I saying this right? Where Fano? Hope I am. Anyway, that's where exactly. it's like where Fano. Where Fano. From the south. No, better than me. See my southern self. <laughs> where Fano? Where Fano? Got it. Um, but the other votes is the exact number of votes that was the voting difference. How weird is that? I've actually seen it where one vote has been the difference in some of these counties, right? And so we wanna to start to say, where did we miss these voters? Because I don't care what you say, we miss them. We miss them, the Republican party missed them, everybody missed these voters and they're there. These are people actively engaged in the process. So the way that I look at GOTV efforts uh, is as what's the lowest hanging fruit? It's these people, because they're already voting. The second group are the people already registered to vote that didn't vote. Because obviously at one point in time, they wanted to be part of the democratic process. They're just not right now, right? And then third are the people that aren't registered to vote and you have to get them all the way through, right? But these folks are the lowest hanging fruit. 
So we've got to start to figure out, okay, how do we how do we bring these folks into the fold, right? And it matters when you get into, because look, clothes can flip. <laughs> look how many there are. <coughs> and in the places where we did flip, like Alamosa, it did flip in the Senate. Remember back down here, it was red for the presidential election. By the time we got to 2022 for the Senate, it flipped. Um, oh, wait. Yes, it did flip. Oh, so let me just show y'all something. So if you look right here, for the Senate, it it was Dems. And for the House, it was it was Republicans. Usually when that happens, not always, but usually when that happens, the person is a is um is the incumbent. So when you see a split on the ticket, typically the 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 person is an incumbent, and so that's why they're getting that vote to stay in, which is crazy but true, right? So I just wanted to point that out because I was like, you see it, it's here with Archuleta as well. There were several of these. Colorado made you guys made me go dig deep. I was like, what in the world? But there was a lot, there's a lot of split, split voting happening between your Senate and your house, which is interesting. Um, but when I got here, so you see, this is how many counties I had. I don't know why grand is not typed right here because it should be. Um, then I get down to say, remember, because I'm looking for power, all of these counties were district three. All of them. So only two weren't. Immediately, I knew every single one of them was going to make the list because that's incredibly powerful. And it says something about rural folks. So the next piece that I looked at is, is there a trend in terms of their voters and voter registration? So back in the spring when I did this, this is what your voter registration looked like. And in terms of the active and, uh, and um, um, inactive, unaffiliated voters, there's over 60,000 of them. So in the state of Colorado, in these counties, you have over 60,000 people who are unaff unaffiliated with any party that are either inactive or active. And then if I break them down for the active, it's 51,000. So most of them are active. So you've got almost 52,000 voters that you can 100% get engaged in the process who are already registered and active to vote. They're just unaffiliated right now. The way that we go about this is it's important not to punch left um, or right for that matter. It's not about that. And quite frankly, people are sick of it. So I have this saying, and Mark and Stephanie have heard me say it a thousand times, probably not a thousand, but quite a bit, is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So the question for these voters is, why aren't you affiliated with a party? And you're not affiliated, so who do you typically vote for? Why aren't you? Can you share with me? So instead of saying people, can I tell you something? Will you tell me something? Because tell is such a word, right? I will say to people, well, will you share with me what party you're voting with? Will you share with me, you know, why you didn't vote uh, for Biden in the last election? Will you share with me if you plan to vote in 2024? Will you share with me what's your biggest issue? What's your biggest concern? So by doing that, I'm saying it's a together thing. You're sharing with me, which makes it a connection, right? Which makes it intimate in some way. And then I'll say, well, can I share with you why I'm voting? Can I share with you why, why I'm out today knocking on doors? Can I share with you why when I could be doing a million other things, I'm taking time out of my day to phone bank? Can I share with you why I'm supporting this particular candidate who maybe I don't love, right? Um, but it makes it a collaborative exchange of information and it builds connection. And what we know is that connection plus information um, and inspiration will drive people to vote. It simply will, right? 
So the last thing that I want you to look at is you all are actually gaining overall registered voters. You're up by 0.12% uh, in terms of the number of voters. You've gained 927 voters between 2020 and 2023. <clears throat> so all of that is good stuff. So let's talk about ways to use the data. Um, and we'll talk about what I call the four pillars um, when it comes to issues. I think that every issue comes back to either health care, housing, education, or um, economic security, mobility, whatever you want to say in there, right? But the economy. Um, and so when I have this data and, and issue data combined together, I can take this data to strategize, like I said before, between my GOTV efforts and, and where I want to spend most of my manpower, my money, and whatever. Is it going to be knocking doors? and getting people out to vote? Is it gonna be voter registration? But how can I use this money when it comes, um, this data when it comes to funding? I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, so give me your thoughts around, if you have any, around what this data means and how you can use it from a funding perspective. Anybody wanna jump in? Veronica's probably like, no, girl, I heard you say it on the last call. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the things that is very powerful, right? When you go to ask for funding for something, a lot of people will just go, hey, this is what we're passionate about. This is the impact that we want to have on people. And this is why you should give us your money. Okay, well, I'm glad you're passionate about it. <laughs> but why should I give you this money, right? So it's much more powerful when you can say, so listen, there are seven counties in district three, five of those counties um, had margins of 200 votes or less in the last house election. And what we know is their greatest issues are this, these are the number of available registered voters that didn't vote last time. So we would like funding to do a strategic door knocking campaign to have a strong GOTV to get those 27,000, almost 28,000 registered voters in those seven counties out to vote. Because we know if we can shift 100 of them, 200 of them, 250 of them in each of these counties, we're gonna win that seat. Does that make sense? That's a much stronger argument for give me your money than Lauren Bobart's an idiot and she shouldn't be in office, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> When you think about the data, I want you to think about how you can use it for funding, how you can use it for building relationships with philanthropic organizations, how you can use it in terms of strategy and organizing um, in terms of your manpower. And then what does it mean in terms of issues and, um, and issue related campaigns and initiatives? So um, let me ask, I know that Stephanie and Mark come to the monthly networking calls. Um, has anybody else that's on here been to the monthly networking calls? I've been doing them since July. Has anybody else joined on them with us? Because like the one that we did last year, last week, last year, geez, the one that we did last Thursday, um, we used healthcare as a big initiative. And because we know that two issues that are going to be huge this year um, in terms of the 2024 election cycle are going to be what? Abortion and democracy, right? So we looked under healthcare and we took that on to talk about three different things, to talk about um, abortion bans and the impact of them, Medicaid expansion and rural hospital closures. And what does that look like? And so the strategy is what's the framing around how to have that conversation? Because a lot of times if you just start to talk to someone out of abortion, that wall goes up and there's no conversation to be had. But what if I were to say to you and share with you that your morality is actually hurting the people that you love. <clears throat> people are going to say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? I'm not hurting anybody that I love, really? Okay. Well, would you agree with me that in rural places, it's already hard to recruit physicians, much less specialists to our community? People are going to say, absolutely, because it's true, right? Well, since in the states that have had abortion bans, um, it, those numbers have increased dramatically because OBGYNs do not want to practice in a place where they can be prosecuted for simply doing their job. 
And there are certain procedures that may be required even in, even in delivering a baby, right? That are now illegal in those states. So what you see are OBGYNs not coming to those states, OBGYNs leaving those states, less OBGYNs, uh, people enrolling in school to become OBGYNs, right? And you might think, well, this doesn't apply to me because Colorado doesn't have that. Well, I want to show you something um, because what happened last Thursday is we were on this call, we were talking about this and I was talking about the impact that it has because in most rural places, we have high rates of maternal vulnerability and we have high rates of maternal um, deserts, right? Where we don't have maternal care at all. So I had put one of the links in from that healthcare resource page and uh, and said, you can actually look up your state's information. And somebody came back and she said, I have to say something, Danny. She said, I just thought I would take a quick peek while you were talking to see like what our numbers are because I'm in Colorado and you know we're not one of those states. And, and she was like, I was surprised to see the number of places and counties that have um, high rates of maternal vulnerability. So I'm gonna share that with you because I already pulled it up. And then I want you to see why the data matters because this surprised me when I looked at it myself. So where you see the darker colored purple, those are the counties with higher rates of maternal vulnerability. Where are Colorado mothers most vulnerable? So do y'all know which state, which counties those are? I want you to see, think about our top 100 list that we've just been talking about and look what the counties are. Alamosa, Conejos, Rio Grande, like right here, one, two, three, wait. One, two, three, four, five, five, six. Yeah, like five or six of them made our list. Right, Mark, they are. Five of them are the ones that we just talked about. How crazy is that? And they're also the counties with the greatest Latin, Latin populations. So, and that's the other thing. So one of the things that um, I was talking to Matt about is how much the, the, the progressives and the Democratic Party have to get Spanish speaking organizers um, because we have to be able to have conversations with the Latino population, um, have to, have to, have to, not only because it's the fastest growing language in this country, right? But Republicans are working really hard to win them over. And in that culture, my son-in-law is, um, is Hispanic. And in that culture, there's a big focus um, around money and, and this idea of, um, mm, there's, there's a lot of um, what I would say traditional thought processes around family, around money, around all of those types of things. And we need to be having conversations in a way that is non-threatening, in a way that um, makes sense and actually shows um, the benefit of voting progressive. Um, yeah. I would, I would wonder the same thing, Mark, right? Um, because what we know, like we, we already know the statistics around, you know, maternal, um, maternal death rates among black women compared to everyone else. Um, it would be interesting to see what those are in Colorado and broken down by race. And you can do that using, um, you know, some of the healthcare data that I gave or going to your Department of Health's website. But so this is what I'm talking about, being able to take your population data, your demographic data, your voting data, um, and then issue data. And the goal is to just have one or two things from each of the issues that most affect that population in order to have legitimate conversations with them and conversations that mean something to them. Because just saying, hey, you know, we, vote, we, we want your vote. So have you earned it? What are you doing for, for these people? What do you know about them? 
What do you know about their issues and their greatest concerns? Um, I shared this last uh, last call and I'll share it again because it's something that, you know, where I am, where I am, the votes are like 85% Republican, 80% Republican, right? Our most progressive county in this region is 60-40 um, is the split, like 65-35 is the split. That's our most progressive. <laughs> and you hear a lot of talk about how fiscally responsible um, our state legislature is and our governor is, and they love to brag about it. And so what I say to those individuals um, is real simple, is if let's just say I had three children at home and $50,000 just sitting in my bank account, just sitting in savings, it's my rainy day fund, right? <laughs> Which is what Governor Will Lee calls our few billion dollars. It's a rainy day fund. And my children didn't have insurance, hadn't been to the pediatrician, um, you know, have were reading on a grade level three years behind where they should be. Um, they weren't wearing appropriate clothing, right? They didn't have access to food and healthcare. And DCS came to my house. Would DCS say to me, gosh, you are so physically responsible, fiscally responsible. You're doing such a great job saving money. Or would they take my children? They would take my children, right? Because I wouldn't be fit to be a parent. Meanwhile, many people, many governors, many people in our state legislatures, they brag about being fiscally responsible, but they have thousands of children that don't have access to, to, to healthcare, that are way behind in education standards, that you know, have food insecurity, all of those different things. And we should take those children away from these people because they do not deserve to govern them. And when you say it like that, it just makes plain sense. And you can have that conversation with anybody and they get it because I promise you, DCS visits poor people more than they visit rich people. Poor people will get that conversation. So that's just another example of framing and how to go about using, um, using the data and the information. Um, let me see. <clears throat> but, uh, I'm reading the chat, by the way. Hold on. Yeah, so I would say, so the question that Mark is asking is, would the data indicate that we need to examine these campaigns messaging? I would say yes. Um, and the reason I would say yes is because of the low num the, the low voter turnout, right? So that's what I meant by when I say we're missing these voters. Because if the messaging is on point, we won't lose them. Um, and, you know, I... I have never run a campaign. What I have done is I'm lying. I did, but it was an issue campaign, right? So when I, when I led the healthcare protest here, I was my own campaign manager, comms person, <laughs> policy person, research person. I was my own everything um, and learned as I went. But what I can tell you is that in this region where it is 95 to 97% white and I'm biracial, I'm a biracial woman who definitely experiences the world as a black woman, right? Um, I was still able to get people in this region to come out for community forums, to come out to protest every day for almost nine months, to get 30,000 local signatures and take them to Congress. So what does that tell me? It tells me that good messaging on a vital issue will mobilize people that are traditionally on op opposing views than you. And the thing is, is I'm even, so during that protest, because they were just getting to know who I was, um, even though I was born and raised here, I'd been gone for a while. I was staying away from things that would be too divisive because I was focused on healthcare, right? Now I'm focused on other things. So I, I pretty much share everything via my social media, um, media. And I have about, I don't know, 35,000 followers on my Facebook or so. And some of those people vehemently don't agree with me on certain issues. And they don't leave me um, and they don't leave my page and they don't stop following because I've earned their trust 
um, and they, they are willing to listen and I, and I push the boundaries with them, you know, um, and that's what it takes, right. Um, is being able to say, listen, I get why you, I get why you feel the way you feel. And can I share this with you? So yeah, messaging is a big thing. It's, and it's, it's not just messaging, but it's delivery, it's framing and it's authenticity for me. You can have the best data in the world, but if you are not authentic talking to people, you might as well be talking to the wall because rural people and inner city people can smell in genuine people a mile away, <laughs> right? We know when you're trying to be excess. So, you know, yeah. So yeah, we need to be able to strategize on the ground game and on messaging. And so the purpose is to have the data on these calls, Mark, right? The data and the deep dives, which is why, you know, we've put up the blog and everybody has links to all the presentations and all the videos, all the recordings. Um, and then the monthly networking calls is to look at how we frame things. How do we mobilize? Um, who wants to organize? And they're not affiliated with a party. They're not affiliated with an organization or coalition, um, but they want to be able to, to network with us and, um, and find, okay, so how do we do that? Um, so like, I've been, I've been telling you, if you want to set up one-on-ones and you want to have a group of people and I do trainings and framings and all of those things, we can do all of that. The goal at the end of the day is to, is to make progress and build power by this time next year. And we've got to start today period. We don't have, we don't have any time because I promise you, um, who are the people? Is it, uh, Americans for prosperity? They were here two weeks ago, knocking doors here in a region that they own. They were here knocking doors. Why do I think so? I think they were here because I think Marshall Blackburn is scared of Gloria Johnson. <laughs> That's why I think they were here, <laughs> but they were here. Uh, any other questions or comments or concerns or anything? I'll jump in with a couple things if I can. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. I uh, really appreciate your approach on this. Um, a couple things I'll say. Uh, in I, I live in two places. It keeps life exciting. I'm back and forth, a two-hour drive between the two. I serve on the city council in Canyon City, but I'm also involved in community things in Summit County, Breckenridge. And I saw recently in the newspaper that um, what appears to be some kind of conservative, conservative or right-wing group is working very hard in the local school board races. And Summit County has about a 20% um, immigrant population because of the service economy here. And they were holding a special event for Latino voters that the conservatives were and were yeah. barring a, a progressive current member of the school board from even attending to even know what they were doing. So I'll, that's one thing to just say, they are doing this work on the ground that we have got to up our game a whole lot. And, and then yeah. the other thing I'll say is specific to your list of counties. Uh, in 2012 and 2016, I ran for the state Senate uh, in a seven county rural district, Northwest Colorado. Garfield County was one of those counties uh, that I ran in. And um, I, I always said then, and I still say now that, the, and they're getting closer and closer, but when they are able to elect a democratic county commissioner for their three board, three member board of county commissioners, then I will know that they're gonna be able to do some more, you know, support some more Democratic candidates. And they're getting closer and closer, but it's such a struggle there. They, the county commissioners in that county are allowed to serve for life. There's no term limits. So they've had the same gang there for many, many, many years. Um, so anyway, I think Garfield County, because of its numbers and because of the things you point out, is really a, a key county for a number of races. That's interesting. I've never heard of a county commission without term limits. Um, but, you know, we, ha we have we have the same, it's like the same people. Rusty Crow's been in office here for like 30 flipping years, right? Um, and what I will, so the way that I approach that with people is I'll say, gosh, aren't you tired of the good old boys? 
because I am, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody Mm -hmm. who is at risk, the most vulnerable of our population, they are not fans of the good old boys. They just don't Mm -hmm. think there's any way to get rid of them. Um, Right. Yeah. But so when you can say that and, you know, (laughs) it right, like royalty, exactly, Veronica. And, you know, a lot of them will be like, you know, y'all know me, we go way back. And my thing is, I don't care if I knew you in high school anymore. I'm going to put on my Janet Jackson hat and say, what have you done for me lately? (laughs) Right. (laughs) What have you done for me lately? And what I've started saying to people is um, just yesterday, I put up this post and somebody really tried to turn it into a debate about Republicans versus Democrats. And well, the Dems definitely aren't doing that. And I said, listen, I am not necessarily in love with any particular party, but what I do love is humanity. What I do believe in is that my mother, who is almost 80, should have access to health care and the social security that she worked and paid paid into. I believe 100% that my children should be, you know, afforded and my grandchildren at this point should be afforded free public education that is accurate. Um, and you know what I mean? Um, I do believe that everyone should have food on their table and their basic needs met. I do. I believe in that. So whoever's policies work towards achieving that, that's who I'm voting for. Um, and I think when you say it in that way, people look really like crazy if they say, well, I don't believe in that. Really? You don't believe my kids should eat? (laughs) You don't believe, you don't believe your papa. That's what we call them around here, right? You don't believe your papa should have money in the bank. He's he worked in 40 years in that coal mine. Papa shouldn't have his SSI. You know what I mean? He should have a social security. Um, but you have to make it real for people like that. So um I really I think that we're gonna get there. I really do. I think we'll I think we will make it in 2024. I do believe it is gonna take work. Um, and we can't do it the way that we've been doing it because the way we've been doing it is not working. We want 2020 by the skin of our teeth and, um, yeah, it's not working. And, but you're exactly right. When I said they're going after, cause I saw them coming after Latin, uh, Latino voters in Georgia. They are 100% because there's a lot of those traditional values and beliefs around uh, money and family structure that, um, that resonates with them. And a lot of, a lot of them are Catholic too. Um, So again, there's just all those layers. Um, My son-in-law, my son-in-law and I chat about this quite a bit Um, (laughs) because he's Hispanic, but yeah. Um, Thank you for contributing and sharing my my hope is, is that the folks that are coming to these deep dives come to the monthly calls and, um, and we all get connected in such a way that um, it's not just even once a month. It's that, you know, we're getting together to talk about this one thing over here and how do we approach, you know, charter schools and edu- public education and all of, because that's the other big thing that's happening. Right. And all of them kind of go together. Um, but I think that people are going to see the impact of rural voters in 2024. I really do. So anybody else want to chime in? Let me get, let me show you guys um, what you're going to get. So, oh, I thought I saw a chat. It, it was me, Danny. Yep, yeah, to look at corporate interests. So that's the, uh, yeah, put, hold that thought because I'm going to show that. I want to talk about that too. Why does it say my sharing is paused? I hate it when it does this to me. It doesn't like me sometimes and I really want it to. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, soon. Yay, it'll be fine. <laughs> I couldn't find my share button and click the wrong thing. Okay. So when I send you all this PDF presentation that you see right here, right? You'll get all of this data, the voting data that I share with you as well. But then you're also gonna get a link to, um, you'll get the presentation, the recording, a link to the top 100 rural counties project. And you'll get a link to 
this, but it's a blog and that blog has the link to every single one of the recordings and every single PDF presentation. A link to the 2022 exit interview project, because when we talk about messaging, framing, organizing, being effective, that document is so helpful because I interviewed 50 organizers from across the country and everybody kind of contributed to that. So it's like, how can you use this information for philanthropic organizations? And, you know, what can philanthropic organizations do better in terms of organizing? And what can organizers do? And what do your state legislators need to do? And all of that, all of that stuff. Um, you'll also get an invita invitation to the monthly call. And then the next project that I'm working on is the counties without Democratic Party representation. So all of that will be coming to you. Um, the other thing that I'm working on is a candidate toolkit. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. Um, so that will be coming out before the end of the year. Um, and I think that's about it. Annie, to your point, um, is to talk to look at corporate interests because here's the thing. The reality is, is that nobody likes the rich and snobby guys, right? Um, and so pointing out the corporate interests is a perfect way to do that, right? Um, because everybody is mad at Big Brother in some way, shape, or form. So that's another way to get away from the partisan trenches is to look at corporate in interests. If you if we just stop talking, and this is what I tell people, I don't want to talk about being a Republican or Democrat. I really don't because those are labels that have nothing to do with who we are and what we actually believe. They really aren't. Um, those parties can change their their missions and their statements and their you know their laws or bylaws or what they can change that stuff whenever they want to, right? But what do you believe as a human being? What do we believe as a human being? Um, and so, like around here, people will talk a lot about faith, and I'll say, let's talk about that. You know, when people say don't talk about religion and politics, I said, please, let's talk about them both. Because if you say to me that, for example, you're a Christian, I'm going to ask you, well, what are your Christian values? And if you say to me, it's family. If you say to me, it's, you know, health. If you say to me, it's, you know, um, make providing for your loved ones. If you say to me any of those things, the next thing I'm going to talk to you about is, okay, so what has your, what legislation has your politician put forward? that's helped your family? Did your family get any of the $732 million in temporary assistance um, money that Governor Lee did not give to the state of Tennessee? Because <laughs> the answer is no. So what legislation is actually supporting your values? Not what party says they are. What legislation is actually doing that? what candidate is putting forward legislation that actually supports your values. And then you can have legitimate conversations with people. So that is all I have for you guys. I truly, truly appreciate um, stepping away from the party talk is important. It is, Veronica. I think it's the solution to all of this. I think stepping away from party talk is how we get the unaffiliated voters. It's how we get the independent voters. It's how we get the people who are disengaged from their parties, right? I think it's how we do it <laughs> because it's really not and, about parties. And I think your framing of what legislation supports your values or supports your day-to-day -day life is r really where it's going to matter. Yeah. Yeah, to what legis but when the guy told me yesterday that there that the Republican Party doesn't have any that he said neither party has legislation um, or initiatives to undo Social Security to undo Medicaid and I said Medicare I said dude where are you where are you living that's incorrect <laughs> that is not accurate um, but again sometimes these folks are just regurgitating talking points and they actually don't know fact and. And what I share with people is being ignorant about something isn't bad. I'm ignorant on how to fly a plane. Like I know that I don't know how to fly a plane. I mean, like I know there's landing gear. I know like, I know that, but I'm ignorant. Um, but there's a difference between, there's a difference between being will, ignorant and willfully ignorant, right? I'm willing to talk to someone who's ignorant and open. I am not willing to argue with someone who is willfully ignorant and closed not worth my energy. I'm going to go somewhere where I can actually have an impact. But yeah, 
I'm going to get, um, I've had four of these today, so I cannot promise that I'm going to get out deliverables today, but I will get them out tomorrow without fail. Um, I sincerely appreciate you all for coming. If you have not um, attended the networking calls and you want to, this is the um, this is the registration link. I'm going to drop it in the chat really quickly and give you a chance to click it or copy it. Um, you'll still get it later, but that's literally it. Our next meeting is going to be November 30th. Um, like I said, if you have other people that you know that you know you want to get together and do you know more talking around framing and the data or messaging and issues or um, any of that stuff, shoot me an email and we will make it happen. Um, let me put this in my cool. Okie doke. <laughs> That is all I got. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. What a trooper you have been today. Girl, listen, my throat is burning. <laughs> I know, I know. So okay. stop here. Yeah, Afton goes, oh my God, I feel so bad. And I was like, well, we didn't know when I, you know, when we scheduled this that, but here's the thing. It is so worth it. Honestly, I know that sounds like so, I don't know, hippie-ish or whatever. It is worth it. Because I, be, I believe, you know how people always say we can do better or we can be better. I believe that we are better. We're just covered up in disappointments. We're covered up in frustration. We're covered up in challenges and hurt um, and fear. Many people are covered up in fear. And if we can cut through that, we will find hope and we will be, we will be what we really are, which is much better than how we're behaving right now. So um, I appreciate you all super, super much. I will see you November 30th, if not before. Um, seriously, appreciate you guys. Bring friends, <laughs> bring friends. Um, the You know, there's power in numbers. So let's grow. All right. I'll see you guys later. Have a great weekend. <laughs>